Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome everybody. How are you? Uh, this is Emilia Bruna and along with uh, Zach Sahawi who's working the Zoom, uh, we're here to bring you the lightning talks on conservation status, ecological niches, and the demography of tropical species. Um, here's the way it's gonna work. We're gonna, I'd like to quickly run through the list of speakers today. Um, and then afterwards I'll go through a little bit about the logistics of how members of the audience can ask questions, and then we'll get started with the presentations. Um, our first speaker will be uh, Jennifer Phil from the University of Florida in Gainesville, followed by uh, Francie Foreiro Sanchez from the Instituto de Pesquisas Ecológicas IPE in Brazil, Helena Teixeira from the University of Met Veterinary Medicine in Hanover, Germany, Camille um, Girard Terceu uh, from CNRS in Montpellier, Hermelin Dosa from the Faculty of Agronomic Sciences in Benin, uh, Yasmin Coutinho from the Universidade de Brasilia, uh, Constance Fastre from the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund International in Rwanda, uh, Francesco Martini, uh, National Donghua University in Taiwan, and wrapping it up will be Michelle Spicer from Yale University in the United States. Uh, thanks to you all. Thank you very much for the effort that you put into your presentations. We really appreciate it and for being here this morning to answer any questions that members of the audience might have. Uh, if you are interested in submitting any questions, you already know how it works. After a couple of days of this, please be sure to use the question and answer function on Zoom during the presentations. If afterwards you remember a question or maybe your question didn't get answered during the session, you can please post it on the Whova page for this session and that way other um, other people could see it and the members of our panel will be able to answer it. But for now, please be sure to use the Zoom Q&A button. And with that, I think uh, we'll all mute out here and let's watch some presentations. everyone. My name is Jen and I've been working with my wonderful co-authors and others over the last several years to study how fire regimes structure Caribbean pine savannas. These Central American savannas are quite understudied as compared to those in other parts of the world. So we've been working in Payne's Creek National Park in southern Belize to figure out how burning frequency and burn time of the year affect Caribbean pine seedling survival. Because we know one thing for sure, if you don't have seedlings, you won't have trees. So over three years from 2017 to 2020, we individually tagged and censused pine seedlings in three different environments within pine savannas. Um, we had open, environments which were characterized by mostly grass and just a few shrubs and some trees shrubby areas which were mostly shrubs and some grass and few trees and densely wooded areas which were mostly trees and shrubs and not very much grass so every year we recorded whether our tagged seedlings had experienced a fire or not whether they survived, and we assessed fire behavior by looking at char height on the tree trunks um, and looking at how patchy the fires were. And so we found that in this top table you can see here um, that in open and shrubby areas, fire intensity was fairly moderate, um, but fires were patchier in shrubby areas this bottom row of the top table. Fires were patchier in shrubby areas and in densely wooded areas, fire intensity was higher um, and they burned pretty completely. And as you can see, the proportions of seedlings surviving were about the same with or without fire um, in shrubby areas, 
but they the proportions surviving were much lower after fire in open and densely wooded areas. Now we also burned some open and shrubby areas during the dry season and during the wet season, and we examined seedling survival after one year. And we found that survival was highest in shrubby areas burned in the wet season. Um, although the individuals that we tagged were among the tallest in this, uh, in this group, so I'm not sure, we're not sure whether, how much that influenced um, the higher survival. But overall, we conclude that fire and environmental heterogeneity tend to favor young Caribbean pine survival. Um, the low to moderate fire intensity likely increases the probability that young pines will survive and fuel patchiness such as in the shrubby areas likely increases the um, probability that individuals will escape fire for instance open savannas you know which are mostly grass tend to burn pretty completely um, and grass burns very easily while shrubby areas have a combination of shrub litter and grass which creates more patchiness, patchy fuels. And one cool uh, outcome of this research is that our findings have been used by the fire managers at Paynes Creek to inform their management techniques um, for increasing fire heterogeneity and pine survival. So we're very pleased that this research has contributed to management. And I would very much like to thank everyone who contributed to this study um, all those who assisted with data collection, logistics, um, and my co-authors, and also our funding sources. So thank you very much for listening to this talk, and I look forward to presenting re more results in the future. Uh. Hello everyone, I am Francie Pereira from ESCAS IP and I want to share with you our work Are Black Lion Tamarind Population Viable in the Long Term? So this small primate weighs 500 grams when adults are endemic to the uh, Brazilian Atlantic forest are diurnal and live in family groups of two to eight individuals. Black lion tamarinds are endangered and their population are decreasing. The principal trio for uh, to their population is the loss of the forest cover. Currently, the Atlantic forest presents only 12% of its original extent, with only 8% presenting a good conservation status. Black lion tamarind are currently present in 17 fragments of Atlantic forests in Sao Paulo state. As a trained species in a vanishing and biome, the black lion tamarind presents different risks like fire, deforestation, reduction of the current capacity in small fragments and the climate change. Currently, wild population of black lion uh, of black lion tamarinds were modulating using vertex software, a Monte Carlo individual based simulation of the effects of the factors that influence in population dynamic. The small and isolated population are impacting strongly by the synergetic impacts of a stochastic process. As a result, ecological, demographic and genetic population consequence may interact in a feedback loop, leading the species into an extinction vertex. Here, we aim to estimate the current viability of a now population of black lion tamarind, thus determining conservation strategies that directly impact the viability of the population. Our first step was to look for secondary information about the species, including uh, scientific papers and unpublishing information. Each scenario was simulated 1,000 times for a period of 
100 uh, years, representing 13 generations per the species. We defined a viable black lion tamarind population as one that conserves 98 of gen diversity and has no more than 2% probability of extinction in uh, 100 years. Then we simulate different scenarios. Our first scenario simulated was the minimum viable population. This scenario indicates that for a population to meet both of our criteria for viability, it must have at least of 800 individuals. Only population with this size or more retain 98% uh, of gene diversity during uh, 100 years. Our second scenario of our viability uh, of the 17th population, when is analyzed individually, only two populations are viable, while the remaining 15 have a high probability of extinction. The model also showed that six of our current population of black lion submarines will become extinct in average time of 25 years. The model suggests that the viability of the species depends uh, to great extent of two populations. Their result suggests immediately management action, uh, both habitat and individuals. In terms of habitat management, it is important to implement conservation measures to seek to expand and connect the fragments and improve the landscape matrix to provide functional and structural connectivity that allows increasing dispersal rates and population dynamics. And with this, increase uh, the possibility of gene flow between populations. Likewise, effective management strategies are required to recovery of small population with small population size and more rapid loss of genetic diversity. Finally, our results stress that immediately management action targeting both habitat and individuals are needed. In terms of habitat management, it is important to implement mission aimed to extend to connectivity the fragments such as reforestation. Likewise, effective management strategy involving individuals such as translocation are required for recovery of a small genetically depressed population. Thank you. I am happy to introduce you to my talk about the impact of model assumptions on demographic inference. During the last decades, multiple approaches have been proposed to reconstruct the demographic history of many taxa. Among these approaches, the pairwise sequentially Markovian coalescent method, aka PSMC, has been widely used to estimate population size change through time. However, recent studies have shown that PSMC method can also result from change in connectivity if populations are structured. The effects of connectivity can be inferred using simulations of the inverse system times quotient rate, aka ICR, by considering a annual model of migration and their constant population size. In this study, we model both population size and connectivity change in two sympatric mouse lemur species in northwestern Madagascar, the Macrocebus morinus and the Macrocebus habilubensis. The Macrocebus morinus is the only mouse lemur species with a larger geographic distribution. It is hypothesized that this species involved in the south of the island and colonized at the northwestern during the late Pleistocene. In opposition, the Macrocebus habilubensis occurs exclusively in the uh, northwestern of uh, the island and it is thought to have involved in this region. Three mouse lemurs individuals were selected for whole genome sequencing. The paleo environmental data available for Madagascar confirmed the occurrence of warmer conditions during the last interglacial and cooler and arid conditions during the last glacial massim in the island. In contrast, the African humid period, a well established climatic event that took place in African regions, was characterized by a sudden increase in summer precipitation and followed by an abrupt shift towards more arid conditions. We therefore expect a population expansion and higher levels of population connectivity during the last interglacial and the African humid period. Likewise, we expect a population bottleneck and lower levels of population connectivity 
during the last glacial maximum and after the African humid period termination. Moving on to the results, the blue and the purple curves represent the demographic dynamics of Macrocycus rabilubensis assuming panixia. The horizontal axis represents the time before the present and the vertical axis represents the effective population size. Our results suggest a population expansion between the less interglacial and the less glacial maximum. And that event was followed by population bottleneck starting at the African humid period towards the present. This population bottleneck cannot be explained by climatic conditions, but could be related to the increased competition with Macrocybus morinus after its colonization of the northwestern of Madagascar. Alternatively, assuming population structure, the model parameters that better approximate the IICR inferred by the PSMC, represented by the blue color, and the IICR inferred by the structure model, represented by the green color, suggest that five change in population connectivity. The top vertical bar represents the connectivity change, where warmer colors correspond to higher connectivity levels. Our simulations suggest higher connectivity levels between the less interglacial and less glacial maximum, and lower connectivity during the LGM and most of the African humid period. Again, the population dynamics during the African humid period could not be explained by climatic conditions. For Macrocybus morinus, here represented by the yellow curve, the PSMC assuming population panmixia suggested a massive population decline that started before the last interglacial and reached the minimum at about 70 kW before present. This event was followed by population recovery. Such population dynamics could represent the founder event that happened when Macrocybus morinus colonized the northwestern of Madagascar. Afterwards, Macrocybus morinus experienced a second population decline that lasted until the African humid period. Under structure, the model parameters that approximate the ICR curve under panmixia and structure for Macrocybus morinus also suggest a five change in population connectivity. Our simulation suggests that the higher connectivity uh, levels during the less interglacial, lower connectivity during the less glacial maximum, and higher connectivity during the African humid period until the mid Holocene drop. In summary, the demographic dynamics of both most lemur species were better explained by the structure model. Altogether, our study showed that it is essential to compare models with different assumptions when exploring demographic scenarios. Thank you! Hi, I'm Camille Gérard Tarcheux. I'm a PhD student at AMAPLAM in Montpellier. I'm supervised by Raphael Pellissier, Isabelle Maréchaux, and Ghislain Vélan. The subject of this talk is rethinking the role of intraspecific variability in species coexistence. I'm going to say IV instead of intraspecific variability. IV has been only recently included in the coexistence conundrum, which is the puzzle of how so many species co-occur while competing for the same resources in hyper-diverse communities like tropical forests. When it is included, it is often in models with a variance around a mean species attribute, which can be a functional trait or a performance, like in panel B here, for instance. This method implies that individual attributes differ from each other. That is, that conspecific individuals, individuals of the same species, are interestingly different. Therefore, this view of IV widens the species attribute distribution, blurring the differences between species. Differences between species are crucial for coexistence, and therefore, the introduction of IV in models must be thought through. Instead, IV can emerge from environmental variation. If all individuals respond similarly to the same environmental stimulus, then IV in response can be observed without meaning that conspecific individuals differ. As the environment is multidimensional, observed IV can then just be the projection on few dimensions of the multidimensional species niche. So in panel C here, you can see the species niche on one environmental axis with the same individual showing different measured reactions to different environmental conditions. In a varying environment, this can produce observed IV, and the more environmental axis, the more potential observed IV. 
We accumulated evidence that IV does not blur species differences, thus not preventing stable species coexistence. The first evidence is a theoretical model proving that IV can be observed because of a lower number of measured environmental variables compared to the number of axes contributing to the studied response. Therefore, IV can emerge even within clothes, given that environmental variables influencing the study response vary in space or in time. We also show that spatial autocorrelation in these environmental variables results in spatial autocorrelation in the response, and that the species-specific parameters result in a more similar response among all specifics locally than among heterospecifics. The second evidence enables us to test empirically the theoretical conclusion. We show that we can observe IV in growth in eucalyptus clones, that is, intrinsically identical conspecific individuals. The third evidence is a more complex application to three different tropical datasets, Paracu in French Guiana, Barro Colorado Island in Panama, and Upangala in the west of India. We estimate a high IV in growth taking diameter into account in each dataset. We detect spatial autocorrelation of individual growth and hypothesize that this comes from the spatial autocorrelation of underlying environmental variables, implying an environmental source of IV in growth when making the connection with the theoretical model. We finally show that individual growth among all specifics is locally more similar than among heterospecifics. We link these results with coexistence by supposing that the more similar performance among conspecifics than heterospecifics results in a stronger intra than interspecific competition, which is a necessary condition for stable species coexistence. Finally, observed IV is often a projection of few axes of a multidimensional response to a varying environment. Species differences are not blurred, and species coexistence based on niche differences is possible. This must be taken into account when, when introducing IV in models. Thank you for your attention. If you want to learn more, you can look at the poster that is available at this address. See you. Hello everyone, my name is Yasmin Poutin. I am an undergraduate student in biological sciences at the University of Brasilia, and I'm here to present our research based on the question, do neotropical flycatchers exclude each other in breeding and wintering grounds? Several recent studies have highlighted the importance of migrations of flycatchers within the neotropics. However, it's still a part of known topic. The city of Brasilia is in the core area of the Cerrado region of central Brazil, where we find uh, some of migrants such as the Cronid Islet flycatcher, scientifically known as Grisotiranus aurantiotrocristatus, and winter migrants such as the Vermilion flycatcher, scientifically known as Pyrocephalus fubinus. Since 2019, we have made behavioral observations of both species. Uh, which, which suggests that the summer migrant is dominant over the winter migrant, even causing its exclusion from an area used by both species. Uh, our objective was to investigate whether, whether there was evidence for no overlapping in the summer and winter distributions of these species. We use the records from the bird database for South America and separate the observations into winter months from May to July and uh, into summer months from October to February. The data collected for the crown aids led flycatcher from November 1917 through March 2021 totals 1,669 observations in winter months and 9,575 in summer months. For the Vermilion flycatcher, the data collected from May 1969 through March 2001 Total 21,691 observations in winter months and 42,580 in summer months. 
Then, Ujru, on a scripture posted by Geronimo Dalla Piccolo in GitHub, to clean up the observation data in R5.0.4, which removes duplicate observations and sampling bias. Then, we drew on a script posted by Hannah Owens in GitHub GIS for a max standard assemble modeling. And last, lastly, we model a potential winter in some distributions using the BioMod package for R5.0.4 and the environmental data used there from WorldClim version 2.1 bioclimatic variables for 1970 to 2000 at two and a half Archimedes resolution. Here we have the results of the predicted uh, distribution for Grisotiranus aurantiotrocristatus uh, in winter. The color gradient uh, denotes values which varies from more potential presence of the species, the color dark green, to no potential presence, the color white. And it's in here it's possible to see a higher presence of the crown that fly catching the Amazon region. While in summer, it's in, it's uh, when summer, it seems to be more present in the western part of South America. Um, the for the Pyrocephalus rubinus during winter. It seems to be more present in the western part of its range. And while in summer, it seems to be more present in the eastern part of South America. In the end, our results show clear difference between the winter potential occurrence of the species. And in summer, both species have a predicted range in southern Brazil and Argentina, Paraguay, and Bolivia. But the crowned sled flycatchers predict predicted to have a higher preference in the western part of the range, while the vermilion flycatcher has a predicted non-overlapping preferred area in the eastern part of the range. Uh, and these results suggest there may be indeed distinctive range between these flycatchers of very similar size and feeding habits. Uh, we would like to thank ATVC for the opportunity and the bird for the data we use it. Thank you for your attention. Hi everyone, my name is Friedrich van der Pen and I'm ecologist at the Dinofossil Bureau Elephant. Many of you might know the Dinofossil Bureau Elephant for its work on protecting mountain gorillas in Rwanda. However, what many of you might not know is that actually the biggest conservation area is located in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here, the Diagnostic Gorilla Fund, or DFGF, aims to protect the grouse gorilla. Just like the mountain gorilla, the grouse gorilla is a subspecies of the eastern gorilla, and it's endemic to the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's critically endangered because the grouse gorilla population has dropped with 60% over the past 20 years, and only 6,800 individuals are thought to remain. That's why in 2012, DFGF established the Kuba Conservation Area, a community-based conservation area with a surface of more than 2,200 square kilometers. As you can see from the map, it, the NCA is located in the center of the distribution of the grouse gorilla, and we hope it can become a stepping stone between Maiko National Park and Kawuzibiega National Park. Since 2012, we also track gorillas there, and right now we're following four families all year round. But so far, we never had estimates of the total population size of gorillas in the NCA. That's why in 2020, we surveyed the whole area by doing 97 transects of three kilometers long. Along those transects, we noted signs of animal presence. In the case of gorillas, this is mostly nest site. This is what a distribution of the gorilla size looks like. But more importantly, we also measured the distance from the nest site to the transect. And this uh, perpendicular distance is very important because it allows us to estimate density of gorillas in the area. Using distance sampling, we get an estimate of 0.14 individuals per square kilometer. 
Note that this only represents the number of wean gorillas, because very young gorillas do not make a nest yet, so they can't be counted and can't be taken into account in these estimations. When you translate density into uh, numbers, we have 184 individuals, or uh, anything in the range from 100 to 330 individuals. As I said before, the world's population is thought to be 6,800 individuals. So the NCA has, at this point, up to 5% of the world's population. When we compare the estimates from the NCA with those, the numbers we find in a recent publication, we see that the numbers from the NCA are in the same range as those from the north of Kauzivir. They are, however, lower than estimates found in, the, in an area to the west of the NCA. Right now, it is not clear which factors explain the, the difference in these uh, density estimates. In the next step, we'll look at the factors that influence the spatial distribution of gorillas within the NCA. For instance, distance to villages, distance to mining activities, or vegetation cover. And we'll try to repeat these transacts so we can look at the evolution in abundance. If you'd like to know more, you can visit our website or get in touch with us. Thanks for listening. Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. Today I will be talking about how interannual variation in seedling survival and the strength of, of density dependence are modulated by the abundance of recruits and precipitation. In plant communities, one of the mechanisms that are considered pivotal to explain species coexistence is the jensen connell hypothesis. And this hypothesis posits that seeds and seedlings that are found closer to conspecific adults or at higher densities can su will suffer higher mortality, therefore allowing species to be replaced by different species when they die and therefore maintaining diversity. As we see in the figure at the, at the bottom here, uh, the negative effect of uh, co-specifics is uh, stronger compared to heterospecifics and they can be stronger or weaker depending on species, for example, that we are studying or the studies. As we may imagine, the effect of conspecific density dependence are not constant over time, and one of the causes of temporal variation can be precipitation. In fact, we can expect uh, negative density dependence to be stronger when rain is more abundant, due to increased density and activity of pathogens and predators, such as herbivore insects, that are usually favored by wetter climates. We have evidence of seasonal shifts in uh, negative density dependence due to precipitation, from studies that were conducted in forests with clearly seasonal climates, but we still know little of whether this is also true in terms of interannual changes in total precipitation. Similarly, temporal variation in the number of uh, new recruits will affect these dynamics. In particular, the economy of scale hypothesis predicts that in years of higher recruitment, the reproductive success will be higher. This has usually been linked to the seed to, to seedling transition, uh, with greater seed fall usually resulting in greater recruitment success. However, whether the higher recruitment is then translated into higher seedling survival is something we do not really know yet. So, in this study, we hypothesize that in years with higher precipitation, we will see higher negative density dependence and therefore reduced survival. And According to the economy of scale hypothesis, we hypothesize that in years where there are a higher number of recruits of seedlings that are recruited, there will be higher survival. We to understand uh, and to try to answer our questions, we conducted this study in uh, Taiwan and we used a data set of a seedling uh, monitoring that were collected over 17 years in a 25 hectare plot located in the northern part of the highland, which is part of the forest geo network. Then we model seedling survival over, of over 12,000 individual seedlings for these 17 years to check whether internal variation in precipitation and abundant water cruise influence survival. What we found is that survival was lower in wet years compared to dry years, as we can see 
in this part, lower part of this figure, and this was possibly due to two stronger negative effects or con specific negative density dependence in wet years. That, as we can see here, uh, the survival, the negative effect of con specific seed density was stronger in uh, wet years. Um, in terms of number of recruits, we found that survival was lower in years of low recruitment compared to years of high recruitment, and this was possibly driven by a stronger negative effect of con specific negative density dependence in lower year, in years of low recruitment. We also found an important effect of interannual, intraannual, sorry, temporal turnover in the number of conspecifics. We can see here and here. Uh, with a strong negative effect during years of high recruitment. This means that if the number of conspecifics in any, vegan, in any given year increases, this will be reflected in lower survival. To sum up, uh, again the results, we found lower seeding survival in wet years due to greater negative density dependence, which might be explained by higher density and activity of pathogens and predators. And survival were greater in years of more abundant recruitment, accordingly to the expectations of the economy, economy of scale hypothesis. Thank you everyone for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. My name is Michelle Elise Spicer, and today I'm going to tell you about how source height in contact with terrestrial soil can drive epiphyte mortality. Now, epiphytes are plants that grow non parasitically on other plants, and they are a very important part of tropical ecosystems. They make up about 20% of vascular plant species in the neotropics, and they also contribute to a lot of nutrient and water cycles. But because of their uh, living up in the canopy, they're a little difficult to study, so a lot of basic ecological questions are still open. One of those that I'm going to focus on today is thinking about what happens when epiphytes are no longer up in the canopy. So why does an epiphyte that falls die? And this question is particularly important because we know branch fall is actually an important part of mortality overall. It makes up about 50% of the annual uh, dynamics of epiphyte populations in some forests. And once an epiphyte falls to the ground, about 70% of those adult epiphytes can die within one year. So I have two hypotheses that I'm testing with this research, the first of which focuses on abiotic gradients. Now this vertical niche differentiation hypothesis basically says that epiphytes are adapted to specific heights in the tree. So you might have high canopy epiphytes that really are good in those dry, hot, sunny locations, and then those lower epiphytes in the low strata are more adapted to cool, humid, shady areas. So we can predict that if these epiphytes fall to the ground where it is cool and shady, those low, low strata epiphytes will do a lot better than those high strata epiphytes. Now my second hypothesis, the epiphyte enemy escape hypothesis, focuses a little bit more on biotic drivers. And the soils that epiphytes are experiencing are very different in many ways, and one of those ways that they're potentially different from a terrestrial soil is in the microbial community. So there's a couple of studies that show more abundant or different soil communities when you're looking at a terrestrial soil versus that layer of soil that accumulates up in the canopy. And so here, because all epiphytic species have been evolutionarily adapted to be away from those terrestrial soils, all epiphytes would find that terrestrial soil deleterious or bad. So what I did to test these two hypotheses is go out to the field in central Panama in Veraguas province in the Santa Fe National Park. And I found three donor trees that had fallen down naturally and then collected the epiphytes off of them. So importantly, these epiphytes on the donor trees, when a tree falls, they're actually not contacting the soil. So they're still up on the donor tree. And these type of epiphytes on fallen trees, you can actually observe them for many years after um, the tree has fallen. And so I collected these epiphytes, measured how high up the tree, what strata they were in that donor tree, and then transplanted them to new intact upright recipient trees. And in these trees, I experimentally put them either at zero meters, which is in contact with the terrestrial soil, 
at one meters or at two meters. So I monitored these 270 transplanted epiphytes for a year and a half. So what did I find? I measured many things, but I'll tell you about survival and leaf loss today. Across the x-axis, we're looking from low to high in the original donor tree. So where did the epiphyte come from? And just like we hypothesized, we actually did find much higher mortality rates in those high strata species. So you can see that about 80% of those low strata epiphytes survived after a year and a half versus only about 46% survival in those high epiphytes. Likewise, we saw a much higher leaf loss rate in those high epiphytes in comparison to the low ones. Now for our second hypothesis, what we're looking at on the ground is in the new tree, the transplanted tree, were they touching the ground or were they just up above that ground? We also found um, support for this hypothesis where our ground epiphytes, the ones that were now in contact with the ground, only had about a 50% survival rate versus about a 66% survival rate if you're off the ground. We also found similarly that the highest leaf loss rates were in those ones in contact with the ground. So overall, um, to think about why epiphytes die on the ground, we can see that there's an important role for both biotic and abiotic factors. And I'm following up these studies looking at the abiotic gradients and also the microbial communities. With that, I'm really excited to participate in the live session and I hope you can contact me and talk more about my research. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Holm from Berkeley Lab, and with the help of my co-authors, I'm going to be talking about, about both how demographic models and Landsat remote sensing can help us predict tropical forest recovery. This talk is motivated by the fact that we need to improve the bridge between comparing remote sensing and modeling, which for a long time have been separate fields, um, but are very powerful when used together. For example, forest simulation models can be validated by remote sensing and then once we have these strong validated models, they can be used for answering many future ecological questions. So our study is located in the central Amazon and we'll be analyzing Landsat 5 images of recovery after clear cut and large wind throw disturbances um, that occurred in the 80s. So we have over 30 years of recovery images. And these are images from our sampling sites and the small blue boxes shows where the sampling was done and we've compared the disturbed areas inside both the clear cut and the wind throws to nearby undisturbed forest. Here are the results from the changes in near infrared reflectance and this is just after wind throws and we found that near was the best predictor from Landsat of forest regrowth and recovery. Um, and here you can see the sudden decrease in reflectance from this disturbance and this fast peak, which is the change in reflectance of the forest canopy after the wind throws. And then the slow, gradual slope down is the recovery and regrowth um, and with it taking on average about 41 years for the forest to return to the pre-disturbance reflectance. Here are the Landsat results now after clear cuts. And again, you could see the sharp increase in near, which is the reflectance properties of the bare ground, and then a return to pre-disturbance on an average after 35 years. So compared to wind throws that we just previously saw, this is a faster recovery and also steeper slope and higher initial reflectance. A main point of this paper is improving the application of models, which we're using the FATES model here. And there are lots of pros to using these demographic and dynamic vegetation models, um, which mostly includes that, we, that now we can include varying levels of disturbances and plants will complete, compete for light, water, and nutrients based on varying plant traits. So we're also able to represent varying levels of canopy structure, size classes, and all with different successional statuses on these different patches um, uh, since disturbance all of course which are part of, of complex tropical forest. In order to simulate tropical forests with a range of early successional fast-growing pioneers and also late successional cohorts, cohorts, we varied the plant traits for both wood density and VC max. 
and these two traits both impact growth and productivity. And then in addition, we also varied leaf canopy traits, so things like that affect the leaf areolometry and leaf clumping. And the dark green points here represent the fast-growing pioneer PFTs. Here are the model results from FATES, so showing the recovery in forest structure, which structure uh, here is biomass and stem density, and it's showing um, the recovery after wind throws in orange and after clear cuts in the black lines. And the model predicts a slightly faster recovery time after wind throws, um, but also the model performs very similar in the time periods of recovery as the near observed results, as you could see in the box at the bottom. Um, and then with biomass, you can see this steady increase in biomass over time. And then with density, there's this initial, a very high initial peak of density in small trees and then return to pre-disturbance uh, values about after 40 years. These are the results more related to canopy coverage. So things like LAI and crown area, and maybe a better comparison to Landsat. And just like near here, you also see the fast recovery of these canopy traits, um, the overshoot, and then also the return to pre-disturbance values. And strong similarities between the model and near is that after clear cuts and the black and gray, there are these large losses um, and then also very high peaks as well. Um, so, so this is good seeing these similarities. Um, and then an interesting thing though with the model is that the model predicts that the canopy area always remains higher than the previous old growth after large disturbance. Here is a summary with some of the similarities between fates and remote sensing. Thanks. Well, hi everybody, welcome back and uh, thank you very much. And um, that, this is also my opportunity to introduce Jennifer Holm who um, was our final speaker there, who was shifted into this session uh, from yesterday. Thanks a lot Jennifer for being willing to make the jump over here. Um, apologize for not having your name to give you your introduction in the beginning. Um, but the price you pay for my getting to do this now and um, and making sure to, to highlight um, you know, you hear at the end is I get to ask the first question and it goes to you if that's okay. Um, got a couple of questions here that have come in and I'm gonna start with one and then maybe we'll loop around back to another one, which is um, at the very end, you pointed out this really interesting result that the canopy cover turns out to be highest in the disturbed areas. And then you you slid nicely into your thanks a lot, see you later. And um, and yet that was, <laughs> don't think we didn't notice that that was, that's a really cool and unexpected and interesting result. And so is there, uh, can you speculate as to why that is? Is that the composition of the species that comes back? Is it something about the model structure itself that seems to favor particular species? And so when when the models run, those are the ones that, that uh, end up in your kind of digital space taking over. You can't get away. You can't just leave us something like that without, you know, giving us something. Come on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, that, that's a great question. Um, yeah, that, I think that it's a combination of um, certain uh, that the early successional PFTs were staying and persisting in the model when they probably shouldn't. Um, so it, it was, I think, a it is, I think, still like just a model error that definitely needs to be looked at and needs to be adjusted where some of the PFTs are still not following the, succession, the successional uh, track as they should be, that some are still persisting. Some of those earlier successional ones are persisting and, and earlier successional is still just the traits really that we're giving them. You know, it's, it's, it's based on the things like the, the wood density and the BC max and a lot of other traits related to mortality, you know, the, the, the growing fast, dying young. And so I think that some of those um, traits are still persisting, which, which some of those early successional trees do kind of have some of the larger um, LAI and kind of larger leaves and things like that. So yeah, we were happy to at least match um, some of the remote sensing just overall trends, which was good because once we showed that the model can match the overall remote sensing, we're hoping that maybe the model then can be used to answer some of these other questions. But yeah, getting down in some of this coexistence and, and competitive exclusion is still definitely needs to be looked at in the model. 
I wouldn't call it an error. Let's call it an informational artifact. How about that? Yeah. And, yeah that gives you a chance, you know, something to follow up on. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, a question came in for Francesco uh, um, here as well. Um, and that is, how do you disentangle the effect of species-specific parasites from other effects, non-specific parasites, the effects of humidity, rotting seeds, etc.? So thank you for the question. So in, in this study, we, we, we didn't look at that and we couldn't do it like, because it's, it's part of a monitoring study that continues like since 2003, 2004. But the best idea would be probably to do some experiments and like planting seedlings for different species and doing some exclosures, other form exclosure for isolating insects. If you want to look at the insects using some fungicides or other products to isolate the effect of pathogens and look at different, I mean, what is actually affecting mortality more or less in, in different species. But in like this kind of studies, which is like a, a monitoring work that continues every year and is not supposed to be like touch and uh, disturb, or at least we try to disturb it as least, the least possible. So in this case, we didn't have like a real answer. We can speculate whether it might be more due to higher pathogens or herbivory when it's ears are wetter and there is more rain, but we couldn't actually test it. So we should probably do some more like yeah, experiments with planted seedlings, it would be easier. Thank you, Francesco. Do you mind if I follow up with another question here that came through, which is uh, since we've got you, um, I, I think to summarize here, you, you found higher precipitation led to lower survival, right? It appeared because yes. of perhaps greater negative density dependence. Do you know what the predictions are for precipitation in the region for the next 100 to 150 years? You know, we tend to think of a lot of these kinds of forests as having decreases in precipitation or increased in drought frequency and intensity, but that's not universal. Are you going to find more or less precipitation? So I look a little bit and what I found, what they predict is more than like, yeah, still any, an increase in extreme events. So probably this is already in Taiwan. It's already an island with experiences typhoons basically every year around this time it should be. There was actually one these past few days in the northern of the island. So yeah, the, the prediction are more, yeah, that there will be more extreme events. So maybe more typhoons, more abundant precipitation in very short times, followed by maybe some periods even of drought, even though it's not really common in that area. This, the annual precipitation is some years over 4,000 millimeters. So it's really like a lot of rain. So, but yeah, I think it will be more of, yeah, this more extreme events rather than like, right there. and this is might also be like kind of a limitation of the study because we look at annual precipitation, but usually it's very concentrated in a shorter time, maybe during the typhoon season rather than spread out along the year. Thank you, that's great. Um, uh, Franci, a question came th through for you. I can't remember if it was in the. Uh, yeah, it was. So it was in the Q and A, but uh, I'm not sure everybody got a chance to see it because it popped it over to the other tab. So I was gonna give you an opportunity, Franci, to tell us if there are any reforestation or corridor-related activities in the range of black lion tamarins. Um, you know, we we don't have to address the the setup for the question, which was the actual political situation in Brazil, if you don't want to. But if there are just any current reforestation or corridor related activities, that would be really useful to know in the context of dispersal being potentially important here. Well, uh, thank you for the interesting question. Well, the greatest pressure for deforestation in Brazil happened today in the Amazon. Since the Atlantic forest has already suffered a lot in the last 500 years. For the Black Lion Tamarins, our organization, IPE, has, has ongoing reforestation project, which has already restored more than 2,000 hectares of corridors and has plans to research 5,000 hectares by 2025. IPE is working in the DREAM map. Uh, it's a strategy that shows the priority areas for connecting forest fragments in the main occurrence region uh, of the black lion tamarins. Remembering that the black lion tamarins is an umbrella species. And they forest corridors held uh, a lot of fauna 
like tapirs and cleaning species, birds. So this is our work with reforestation. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question came through here for Constance. Um, yeah. And I, I think, so uh, over to the West, one of the populations seem to have uh, really, really high density per kilometer. It looked like about 1.17. Compared with uh, the estimates, I think from the region where you and your teammates were sampling, about one up uh, zero point one four, which is a huge difference, right? That's like an eightfold difference. Yeah. If I, I did the math here um, in my head quickly, I I know um, that Frederick and the talk mentioned that uh, there wasn't a lot of certainty about the mechanisms, but is there any speculation at all about why population density can be so variable in a you know? not too far apart. That's a huge, huge difference in an animal of this size. Yeah, um, we don't really know. Um, I mean, also our estimates are quite broad. If you look at the range, it's from 100 to 330. So there might be also, you know, like all these studies are based on transects, which is still, you know, like uh, encounter rates, etc. So these are estimations. So it's very difficult to know if you can't really use the number as an absolute number. It's more of an indication. Uh, well, the greatest threats to the um, gorillas in our region are hunting and then also activities like mining uh, that drive them away. So um, one potential thing could be just less people hunting in some areas than others uh, or less human activities. But we don't really know because, yeah, the, the rainforest is very dense. It's very difficult to know what is actually going on inside the forest. Uh, historically, we also have had all the rebels in the area, so we have similar number found similar numbers to those in the this region of Biega, where we know there have been uh, people uh, rebels uh, just hunting gorillas. So it might just be uh, an impact of uh, previous hunting uh, pressure, uh, but that's very difficult to know at this stage uh, what is really going on. Thank you. Great. I. We got two questions here on deck, one for Jennifer Phil and then another one for Jennifer Holm that came through the Q&A section. So let's start with Jennifer Phil, if that's okay. Um, uh, the first here, it says a uh, technical question here. What What is concretely, I mean, what is meant by fire heterogeneity and uh, what is its actual impact on pine populations, maybe more broadly defined than um, than the recruitment? But what, what do you, how are you defining fire heterogeneity? Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that question, especially because, you know, in science, we use a lot of terms and we're like, oh, everybody knows what this means. <laughs> and it's like, wait, I'm not really familiar with that. So, um, yeah, for fire heterogeneity, we're talking about, you know, how how completely um, fuel is consumed. So if you have an area, say, of grass and all of the grass burns, we would say that that fire is pretty homogenous, so not very hetero heterogeneous. But if you have patches of unburned vegetation in a bigger area that burned, we would say that it's heterogeneous. So in this case, in our study, you know, we were finding that um, areas that had more, um, you know, broadleafed litter um, wouldn't burn as completely. And so there would be spots where, you know, if you were a lucky pine seedling that had grown there and the fire didn't burn there, you were more likely to survive. Not always, but, you know. Um, and so, yeah, to the, the bigger question of, you know, what is the effect on pine populations? Um, that's our next step. So, um, we're actually really lucky to have these data. Um, you know, our collaborators had initiated this study. Nobody's, I could only find a thesis that was done up in the mountains. This is lowland savannas um, in Belize. So we really have no idea what goes on with natural populations of Caribbean pine. Um, and they have some adult data this data set was really messy. So I'm really excited to have the seedling data done. And once we clean up the adult data, we're going to try to, you know, use as much information as we can to model populations where, you know, fires burn in, in different manners. So yeah, very good question. Thank you for asking. 
Great, thank you. So I think uh, we'll uh, go to Jennifer Holm and then actually um, Michelle, uh, you're on deck, it turns out for a question. And uh, unless questions come through the chat, that, that may be coming close to the end of the question and answer. But again, we're, I think the speakers are here in case anybody has any others. So please feel free to send them our way. So uh, Jennifer, another question um, came through for here. It starts with a compliment. I should, I should emphasize that lots of people said, thank you, great talk. I, I may have cut that out of some of the questions, which I shouldn't have done, but yes. Um, so great talk. Did you test any other remote sensing indices or relevant bands for forest recovery uh, as well in order to select the NIR? Um, uh, for the sake of the person asking the question, would you remind me what NIR stands for? And then how did other bands or indices do as metrics for recovery? What element of recovery do you think the NIR captures best? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I know I agree that all the talks were really, really interesting. This is great. Um, but yeah, NIR stands for the near infrared um, spectral band. And and we we did test um, six other bands from Landsat 5 um, from their LEADAPS data, from their surface reflectance data. Um, so I, I put the bands in here in the chat, but yeah, they were the um, the blue, green, and red bands, and then two of the spheres, uh, like the sphere one and sphere two. Um, and then through, we, we did different t-tests and ANOVAs, and we ended up finding that the near, the near infrared had the highest significance of predicting the disturbance reflectance and then the regrowth. Um, so yeah, so that's why we ended up picking near as kind of the, the strongest indicator, but sphere was also um, um, had some strong strengths in their in their reflectance at showing in different parts of regrowth as well. Um, but but near was really good at kind of it shows it's able to capture even this exposed woody material and drier leaves after disturbance and death, which was really interesting. So anyway, I put I put a link to our our paper. It's in Biogeosciences and has all the information about the spectral bands. I'm more the modeler, but Robinson the Grand Juarez was the one who's he's the remote sensor. Yeah, actually, that's a thank you. That's a really good reminder. If people would like to go and share additional information, you can do it in a couple of different ways. You can either create a community group um, on Whova for this session, and people can. That's kind of more of a free flowing conversation format. So people can post um, links to other papers or the lab group or post questions and answers discussion. Um, uh, maybe a better way to do it is to put them also over in the question and answer tab, even if it's not a question per se for this session, because that way when people go to look for the for the session, they'll find all the discussion and questions and links that go around it. So if you have other things you'd like to share, papers or preprints or anything else, please do feel free to do that. Take advantage of this kind of, uh, you know, online format and the, the, temp, the resources we have to go with it. They'll be live for several months after um, the meeting ends so people can come, come back to it later. Um, so um, I think that unless another uh, question comes through then that um, I'm going to, I have a final question here then for Michelle. Michelle, you're still there too, aren't you? I have to slide over to that part of my, oh, there you are. Yes. Hey, Michelle. <laughs> so, so the question here is that in your, uh, so I, I, I thought that this was really cool and I thought a lot about um, you know, the, these height effects, maybe these canopy effects. And I think that's really interesting, but it had never crossed my mind that maybe this contact with the ground soil could be something that could be explaining a lot of these really cool patterns. I think that's really interesting. You, you kind of pegged in on the microbial communities and you put this in the context of the enemy effect hypothesis, but there are other potential enemies in the, in the soil too, right? So, um, you know, are there potentially things like, um, nematodes that are herbivores or things like that that you're not finding up in the canopy and so potentially those are the enemies that might be responsible um, for these depressed um, survivorships um, what what what's made you focus on the microbial communities um, or are there potentially other things that might be worth looking at down the road yeah uh, that's a great question um so the, the short answer is we actually don't know that much about epiphytic-biotic interactions. Um, so a lot of the literature really has just focused on abiotic interactions, and um, which of course are also important. Um, but I'm really excited about biotic interactions kind of more generally. Um, and the reason that I've been uh, focusing or I kind of pitch this as thinking about microbial communities um, is just because there have been a handful of recent papers that uh, have looked a little bit at how the microbial community uh, changes across that vertical gradient. 
um, but no one's really tested what that impact is on epiphytes. So I have a couple of collaborators that were, um, you know, we're just kind of doing the first like, see what's there um, and see how the microbial community changes um, as, as you're kind of moving up the canopy and then looking, trying to connect that to, to the epiphyte communities. Uh, so the answer is uh, we don't really know and I'm sure there are a lot of other biotic interactions and I'm certainly interested in what those are, but uh, we're starting with microbial because there's a couple of people I know who are also already working on that. So <laughs> Yeah, we don't really know. And that's an opportunity for us to go in new directions is a great answer for we don't really know. I think that's fantastic. And I'm not surprised. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're if you're trying this, you know, nobody else has done it before. There's going to be a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of unknowns. So I think that's really great. And it, uh, the fact that it um, stimulates all those kinds of questions and makes you think of all kinds of cool experiments that you could do, I think is a really great sign. So yeah, um, thank you. With that, I think um, we're going, uh, we, we have a little bit of time left, but either I, I kind of sit here and vamp like a news anchor who's trying to kill time before commercial, or um, I thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Again, I continue to be impressed by the quality of people's presentations and how cool they are under fire here in the Q&A remotely, um, you know, with questions coming from all over the world. I, I just, I'm really, really impressed by how all our um, participants and attendees have done. And I, I really want to thank you for that and for your contributions. Um, with that, if there are any additional questions, please be sure to head over to the Whova page to, um, to post those. I'm sure our speakers would be more than happy to go and do it. Um, I should say that there's, you know, well over, you know, uh, there, there's a bunch of people in the audience now and, and, but there may be questions coming down the road as people watch the presentations asynchronously later on today or even in the coming days or weeks. So um, do me a favor and check back and see if anybody has any questions for you. And with that, um, you know, on behalf of Zach Zahawi and myself uh, from ATBC News 2021, uh, thanks a lot and um, really appreciate it, everybody. See you around. Hey, Zach, there we go. Round of applause for you all. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the next session, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.